thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, you know, when I was asked to speak about sex, the salt and pepper song did come to mind. And I, um, I didn't really know how to respond to uh, the suggestion that this is what I should speak on. Um, so I think what uh, makes sense is to give an introduction into the work that I do and how, um, I guess, sexuality, whether it be androgyny, whether it's how we understand the male-female, how we understand mythologies around how the animal-human um, divide works or doesn't, is what has interested me. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, um, I studied sculpture um, at Michaelis at UCT and was lucky enough to have Jane Alexander as my supervisor. And Jane has this amazing way of kind of turning on its head our understanding of the animal-human form. And I think a lot of how I started working was inspired by her teaching and how she deals with her work as a sculptor. And at the time, I was struggling with what material to use. And um, was always interested in chemical process and um, organic material and had actually wanted to become a forensic pathologist and not an artist initially. And um, so kind of job shadowed some forensic pathologists and realized that this was not where I wanted to be and put my portfolio to Michaelis and they accepted me. And I was really interested in sculpture, but was struggling with this whole idea of either becoming a wood carver or a metal worker, because that was not what I was interested in, and um, had this dream of cows. So I decided to find a taxidermist, find some cowhide, and start working. And at the time, I suppose I was interested in understanding the animal-human form, and imaging other people was something that I didn't really know how to deal with. Um, because I think the politics of representation are a bit complex and I still haven't figured it out. Um, so I started making molds of myself and my mom and created these kind of life-size hairy ladies in cowhide. And um, this is one of the first photographic works that I made called Europa because during this time, I guess also because of art history and how I was exposed to it at Michaelis, um, I was interested in Greek mythology at the time and the story of the Minotaur and how this creature that was half bull and half man was formed. So I guess in a sort of um, investigation around sex, sexuality, animal, human, how people understand attraction and repulsion, I um, created this image of myself as the Minotaur character. And within that series, I um, started looking at Caravaggio and how the dark sort of rich colors that he was using in his paintings were influencing how I was thinking about my, think my work process. And at the same time, struggling with the self. So having this interesting fight with myself and realizing that all of us have elements or parts of ourselves that we either don't like or don't quite understand or don't necessarily agree with, but we have to somehow confront that within ourselves. So trying to find a way of confronting the animal and the human within myself. And created um, this series of images also centered around uh, Europa, who was the, the daughter of Zeus, who um, was uh, seduced by a white bull, who uh, apparently what happened is that, um, oh, it was Zeus who was the white bull. So he fell in love with her and got, disguised himself as this white bull. And he kind of hid in her father's pastures and they formed a relationship. And he eventually took her off into the wilderness. And she became the queen of what we now imagine Europe to be. So I um, was really interested in that story. And within the whole idea of looking at the self, um, I guess the narcissist was an interesting um, sort of thought or uh, story to me because it's about this person who falls in love with their image but eventually has, an, uh, uh, has the falling in love of, well, narcissist fell in love with himself and was staring at himself for so long 
that in some, in some versions of the story he becomes, he turns into stone, but in other versions of the story he drowns in the pool of water that he was staring at himself in. So this whole idea of self-love and how we do and don't understand it. And so the boundary between, um, I guess, hate and love and how we understand it, I think it's quite a thin um, sort of space. Uh, and within that, I was lucky enough to fall in love with this space in Maputo. My family and I were shopping at a shopping mall and there's a bullfighting arena across the road. And I fell in love with the space and was lucky enough to travel to Portugal and to Spain and watch a whole lot of bullfights. And eventually um, found this man who's a retired bullfighter but now trains his son. So he speaks Portuguese, his son speaks English, and he had two daughters who also spoke English. And I kind of grabbed onto them and stayed on their farm for a month, I think. And eventually the father asked his daughter, because his son never spoke to me while I was there. So I would go and watch him practice, <laughs> go to his bullfights, and he just never wanted to talk to me ever. And I had to rely on his sister to be the translator between me and their father. Mm -hmm. And eventually the father asked his daughter to ask me what I wanted from them. And I said, well, I want you to train me to become a bullfighter. And this man was just like, no, sorry, not going to do it. And his immediate reaction was, he's not going to do it because I'm a woman. And what was so fascinating and refreshing for me about that is that he wasn't thinking about me being black, me being from Africa, or any of the things that I would have immediately thought. He was just like, you're a woman. Sorry, can't do it. So I had to come home eventually and I found a choreographer who helped me with sort of trying to practice the moves that I had been watching over this time while I was away. And um, at the same time, again, having that kind of fight with myself and trying to understand what I wanted my artwork to be about, how I wanted people to understand it, because working in cowhide and being a black female in South Africa um, comes with a whole lot of, um, I guess, baggage. And so there was a time when people thought that I was making comment on the practice of lobola, for instance, and that wasn't at all what I was thinking about. And I needed to find a way of articulating that in a way that was clear, you know. So having this kind of strange fight with myself is what this video is also about. So it was accompanied by a series of photographs. And I guess within this space, I was interested in androgyny as well, and the male-female divide and how we do or don't understand it. And um, I guess coming back to that whole idea of the animal human, the male female, um, and also kind of realizing that obviously within the realm of bullfighting, which is what I was interested in at the time, um, it was quite a male dominated space. And also just within the art world, um, being one of very few female sculptors was an interesting thing. So created this series of photographs that was centered around, um, I guess, taking ownership of the material in a different way and thinking around, um, because, you know, I use a mold to create a piece, but I never was really in the installation. So trying to figure out how to merge my image with the artwork that I make um, and taking a different type of ownership of the material. Uh, what, what is this one? <laughs> uh, I don't know, nothing's happening. Well, what was supposed to be on the screen is um, um, a video called Pasa Doble. Um, so in this video, well, I, I guess within the space of bullfighting, I realized that, oh, maybe you should sit down the volume again. Um, I realized that the, the Pasadoble was an interesting take, I guess, or interpretation of bullfighting. So within the dance, is the, yeah, reduce the thing. Thank you. Um, so within the dance, the male character would be taking on the role of the bullfighter and the female character would be the red cloth that he would use to entice the bull. So um, 
using this dance to, I guess, expand my understanding of um, what artistic language I wanted to be playing with. So I've got two dancers that, I guess, created or, or danced this dance. I, I got a piece of music composed for it, um, music that isn't technically a pasadoble beat. Um, and they were forced to kind of um, use the, sort of, the same sort of pasadoble language, but with a beat that didn't make sense to <laughs> the language of the pasadoble. And I got two female dancers to uh, perform this for me. And what I really enjoyed about them is that they're both very androgynous looking women. So you don't necessarily, besides the fact that, um, you know, I shoot them from basically the waist down most of the time, there are moments where each of them, you can kind of see each of their faces within the screen. And what's lovely about them is that they're both very androgynous looking. So you don't immediately understand that you're looking at two women performing this dance. Um, and this is a series of work that I was commissioned by Pirelli to make for the Joburg Art Fair last year. And I guess, again, thinking around the idea of sex, sexuality, um, fighting versus protecting oneself, um, how we even understand the act of sex, because sometimes it's, it's something that you think you're going to enjoy, but you actually don't. And it could be about the person that you're doing it with, about the circumstance that surround what you're doing. So that kind of like thin space where you don't always have a clear understanding of whether you are enjoying something or not. And luckily enough, um, found the same choreographer that helped me with the bullfighting video. And so we created um, the series of photographs that I wanted to be about me and a male counterpart. So a body double in a way, and us having this interaction. So you can't immediately tell whether we're sort of fighting or embracing each other. You can't immediately tell who is who within the photograph. And so having a bit of fun. Uh, oh, okay. And this is the video that's part of my um, show that I have here at Stevenson. I found a lady called Marie Sara, who is a retired bullfighter who lives in Nîmes. And um, she now trains other people to be bullfighters. So I was interested in her experience of um, bullfighting. Uh, a lot of my work has been centered around memory or the things that you can't capture, things that no longer exist. And having this interview with her about, um, I guess, how she got into bullfighting, why she thinks it's such an interesting thing to do, how she understands the artistry and the theatrical element of the sport. And um, so having this interesting discussion with somebody that you wouldn't immediately uh, assume would be a bullfighter. She's this like fabulous blonde lady who wears Mont Blanc and high heel shoes. And um, having this really interesting talk with her around how she dealt with the very male dominated space, how she um, encountered another bullfighter called Conchita Cintron, who was a, a fighter in the 60s and 70s, 50s and 60s. And um, the fact that, you know, for a long time, because Marie fights on horseback, so for a long time she was the only woman bullfighter on horseback. And um, I guess trying to understand the things that she does and doesn't remember, the things she chooses to tell me and doesn't choose to tell me, um, and being in both her domestic space and also in um, an old bullfighting arena in Nîmes that's now become a museum. So dealing with this idea of things that no longer exist, something that you can't capture anymore. And I am done. Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> Your art, like a lot of your art, you kind of put one foot in this kind of African 
the skins and the kind of tradition and all that kind of stuff. And then you seem very kind of interested in the Spanish sort of world of bullfighting. What is it there that kind of interests you? Well, you know, the thing is that I, just because of how I grew up, I do exist in two spaces. Um, I never had an experience of living on a farm, for instance. I would, I don't think, be, a, be in a situation where my parents would ask for lovola from whoever I was marrying. Um, I, at the same time, have a very like strong cultural background. Um, so it's kind of like this strange combination of so many things. Um, so it, it just makes sense for me to have one foot on either side of things. Yes. The, the thing about the shapeshifter in a lot of African folklore is really important characters, I don't think it's quite ambivalent or also ambiguous. I'm really interested in you finding the Broadway as this place where you can shapeshift in terms of, not just in terms of gender, but in terms of role playing. Mm -hmm. For me, your work is so rich because it sits at the intersection of so many disciplines. When you start talking about sculpture, for example, and you start hearing skin, and then you start thinking well, where the sculpture begin and end. And I just wonder if that's a really conscious mm -hmm. thought process that you're constantly shifting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that it's only now that I realize how conscious I'm making the decision. When I first started making work, I guess because just of my lived experience and being that in between um, or, or having to exist within this in between space of a very particular home life, a very particular public life, a very particular sort of school life as well, I had to find ways of maneuvering between so many things. And so when I first started working, I just thought that it was in response to that. But now that I've been working a little bit more and maybe um, understanding how to articulate that space a little bit more, it's become more of a conscious um, decision. Um, I think I like people to look at that in-between space or wonder about it. And um, so, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very conscious decision now. <laughs> okay, so uh, and then I'll come to you after. Mm -hmm. you, you seem to deal with kind of gender issues and, and kind of sexuality and all that kind of stuff. Is that a deliberate choice or is it just something that you kind of... It isn't, it isn't. Because when I first started working, um, before people knew m my name, for instance, or even knew that it was a female name, there was the assumption that I had to be a man because of the material, maybe, and the fact that there are very few, or were very few, female sculptors at the time. And um, growing up, I used to be confused for a boy. Even now, sometimes I get confused for a boy. So I think that whole idea of how we understand sexuality, how we understand um, where it begins and where it ends, like how do we determine that you're a man? How do we determine that I'm a woman? Um, it's an interesting question for me. It's so it's something that I feel is interested, interesting for me to dig deeper into. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I'll ever find the answer I'm looking for, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the man with the glasses. Uh, yeah. um, your first yeah. Almost incorporating the African with the European mythology. Uh, now, do you still follow uh, mythological guidelines, or uh, do you still investigate those? Yeah, um, you know, I, for the purpose of this presentation, I had to skip through a lot of work. I didn't realize how much work I've made. Um, but what's been interesting about looking at the sort of patterns of, especially the, mytholo the, the mythology part of the way that I work, is that I've looked at Egyptian mythology, Hindi mythology, and now I'm interested in the Aztecs and the Incas of war. So um, 
it, it's uh, quite a broad spectrum of things. And I suppose, like I said earlier, I've always sort of lived in that in-between space. So mythology and how we understand, especially the, the sort of shape-shifting between animal and human is always going to be something that I'm interested in. So I will continue in that part. Yes. Um, it's more of a practical question. No, there's quite a few students here. Um, after you studied at the Calis, what was your process to become, uh, I'm assuming you're a full time artist, mm -hmm. what was your process to get to that stage of having Stevenson represent you and being a career artist? How did you achieve it? Um, well, what happened was that after my undergrad, or at my undergrad exhibition, the National Gallery decided to buy one of my works, and I kind of freaked out. And so, um, after long discussions with Jane, actually, uh, I decided to do my master's because it would give me a bit of time to figure things out, you know, because uh, I was still young then, and, you know, when you have, like, Momo Gallery calling you and Goodman Gallery calling you and, and um, I just I'm needed... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, I'm just explaining my, <laughs> my experience. Um, I needed time and also even if they hadn't been calling, I think I needed time to also understand how I wanted to articulate what I wanted my work to be about. So um, giving myself the space to do my masters and not necessarily taking my time about it, but um, not being in too much of a rush. Um, maybe I also had a little bit of fear, and that probably helped. <laughs> so, um, and was lucky enough to have Jane as my supervisor. So um, within the years that I was doing my masters, kept a lot of people at bay because I needed time to think. And I think that's the one thing that we don't necessarily allow ourselves the time to think because there's this idea that you need to kind of like be rushing. And you know, if a gallery calls you, they have to be the first one that you work with, even though your ideas and their ideas may not necessarily gel. Um, and so I took some time out and studied my masters and um, then within that had time to interact with people and see whether their business model worked with what I wanted to do and eventually decided on Stevenson because we saw each other somehow um, and it's been up and down you know uh, <laughs> with all relationships you have um, good days bad days but we mostly have good days which is great I think within learning how to articulate myself it was interesting to be able to speak clearly with Michael, for instance, about, okay, this is what I want to do, this is what I don't want to do, I don't want to be on that show, I don't want to talk to that person, I don't want to, you know, and having that support structure of somebody who actually listens, because when I first started working, there was, and probably now, this kind of continual interest in wanting me to be in, like, black shows or African shows, this is what I was invited to, and that was not my interest, and so I think by giving myself that time to investigate the different galleries, the different people, I understood that working with Michael would allow me to say no to things that I don't want to be involved in. So, time, I think. Oh, and then I'll come to you. Sure. Just want to go back to the most African and African and African and African and you do it in the to kind of not swap yourself into the whole African artist thing or was it just um, it's a combination of both. I think right now it's more of an intentional tool. Um, I've never lived in a space where uh, there's been a very definite, uh, I don't know, uh, whether it be culture or religion. Um, I went to a Jewish school, a Catholic school, Methodist school while I was growing up. My dad is a Methodist preacher. Well, he's a bishop, I guess. and. Um, having these situations of encountering so many different types of people, so many different theories and thoughts around life, how it works, how it doesn't work. Um, and so I don't think I would have been able to have a very clear or specific idea of how I wanted my work to function or what I wanted it to be about. So it's become more of an, in an intentional thing now, but when I started working, it just was the way it was.
yeah. and then I'll come. Sure. I'm interested in how we just bring this idea of African pain yeah. and African skins. And it seems to me like it's been made a very easy thing to say mm -hmm. like we have another foot here. So see the complexity of Africans for someone to say the African thing to say. So my, my question really or this is just try to understand how do you see because you're an African artist, but it seems to me like there's this seems to be a consensus that this African thing is a European thing and is it this fluidity with your work or this kind of androgen in all these in between space a strategy to deal with that that those easy essentialistic ideas mm -hmm. of what is African and what is European in relation to art and design and representation mm -hmm. because for me your work it's quite amazing and I understand that it's a very strong comment I gave on representation, but I'm quite interested on your conception of when you say you didn't want to go to the African thing or the black color thing. Mm. Are those uh, are those distinctions clear to you? Um I don't think it's a clear distinction to me, but it somehow seems that other people need those labels in order to make sense of me or make sense of certain things. And so um I guess the reason why, for me, it doesn't make sense to be on an African show is because I don't think that life is that simple. Just how I grew up, for instance, like, you know, Jewish school, so like what, what is typically African about being a Jew, for instance? <laughs> um, just how we're bombarded by media, television. It's America, Europe. So whether we like it or not, as African people, there's so many influences that we have that don't really, or aren't in line with what Africanism is, whatever it is. I don't even think that there is a particular way of understanding it because even within like Zulu, Sotho, Kosa, we're all Southern Africans, but have very different ways of maneuvering, very different ways of thinking. So um, it's just a very complex space. So to be boxed in a way doesn't really help me um, and it doesn't help a potential viewer understand something differently. So um, it's interesting that in the context of South Africa is where I've had most of this type of discussion, whereas somewhere else, I guess obviously there is that whole, oh, you come from Africa. But somehow um, the, the, the discussions have been a little bit more dynamic because um, maybe people are more interested in finding out or uh, maybe dispelling what they thought they knew. Um, but in South Africa, I don't know, it seems like we're really stuck in, in a kind of labeling that helps other people feel comfortable, if that makes any sense. Uh, not to bother you again, but uh, have you ever looked at the list of the no. No. And I actually thought that that play on your student book, the Roma, to me was quite an interesting play. Oh, okay. So there are a lot of myths about cows and bulls within as a mythology, which I really enjoy because you make a connection there. Cows in India versus in South Africa versus. In general versus Europe versus America is quite different, but I mm. really enjoyed that play with the European. <coughs> yeah. Okay, I'll take a look. But I would recommend that you maybe explore some of the African because there are some beautiful ones. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. You say uh, Jane Alexander was your supervisor. Yeah. In India, it's not important for people like you and intimidation and You know, Jane is such a wonderful woman that she doesn't even allow you the space to be intimidated by her. Um, she is so, like Jane was my mother for the years that I was at Michaela's. She's so um, nurturing and helpful. And if you do get intimidated, she's like, what the hell, sort your shit out, you know. So um, she never gave me the space to be, yeah. Intimidated. Yes.
Mm. And um, basically, like Snapchat. Yeah, yeah. I made it. I know what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sold for cars. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> they, they have the same value as cars uh -huh. with the whole thing. And I kind of just feel it differently. I don't see it that way. So I've always wanted to know that, like, when you make the sculpture, what exactly are you trying to do? Um, you know, um, when I made that sculpture and I guess that series of work, um, I guess I was interested in that particular interpretation of what my work could be or could not be about. There was a lot of speculation, I guess, like I mentioned, around the fact that, okay, I dreamt of these cows, so now does it mean I'm a Sangoma? <laughs> I um, decided to use my own body and my mom's body, and I'm working in cowhide, so am I comparing us to cows, am I um, uh, kind of falling into that whole women or cows debate? Um, then am I making comment on the exchange of a woman for cows in the cultural um, sort of space of Lobola? And it was interesting to me that these are the things that came up because for me, at the time, cowhide was just a material. So, I was interested in chemical process, interested in organic material, and found this particular thing. It could have been a goat, it could have been, you know, I don't know. And so my, or at least what I thought was just a simple decision around material at the time, was layered with so many things. So I had to accept that, okay, I am black, female, living and working in South Africa, so the material that I was using was very culturally loaded, whether I like it or not, I can't escape that. And um, when I made that work, and, and just that series of work at the time, I was having this fight with myself. So it was around the same time as the bullfighting video, just a little bit before. So having this fight with myself around, so do I continue working in this material and have these associations come up, and not know how to confront it, or do I stop working altogether? Um, and having, I guess, given myself the time and the space, and having someone like Jane around, who has such a wide understanding of the art world, art material, art history, um, helped me kind of bridge the gap to other things and other people who either have used cowhide, have used the same sort of thinking around mythology, have used um, similar thinking around material. So being able to draw parallels and comparisons to other people helped me with how to speak about the work differently. And um, so that work was not about women, cows, lawala, but probably about all of that at the same time. Um, it was about me finding my space through it. <coughs> All right, well, there's one question, and then we can finish. Looking at the world now, it's like, you have your own identity to it, your own type, right? So, um, like, what I want to know is, what do you start your start of work, was it probably fueled by an external element or person which probably you followed their work for all the time, like just wake up and decide that um, you're going to do this type of work. Like, what kind of influence did you do that stuff, regardless of the whole Greek mythology and everything else? I had a dream about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But how did you justify that? You are in the visual arts context in academia. It's like, Lectures are connected simply. Yeah, so that's why I stopped talking about the dream yeah. and started finding uh, sort of theories to support whatever it was. Yeah. So you're saying you read your Hey, be, be nice. <laughs> cool. One last question. What's 
Oh, well, uh, Art Basel, uh, there's a show in Gothenburg that I'm going to in May. Um, I have been nominated for a photography prize, Whoa. so uh, dealing with that, yeah, I was like, what, okay, that's nice. <laughs> um, so dealing with that, uh, making some work, and um, other than that, Building my studio. In Cape Town? No, here in Joburg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.